Good morning and Happy New Year. I'm Rosalie Schaefer and on behalf of the League of Women Voters in the, of Manatee County, I welcome you to our hot topic today. First, we are very excited to be in this building, newly restored after the damage Hurricane uh, Irma inflicted upon it. Um, they got a new roof and um, they managed to um, fix the, the flooring and everything else is you know, working fine. And um, it's wonderful that with the help of this community that it could be restored. All the donations that came in were so helpful to them. Today, we're gonna to be talking about a key part of our government, the judiciary. Our founding fathers, in their infinite wisdom, created a system of checks and balances in our government so that if one branch uh, has, uh, has done something that isn't you know, right, the other part of the government could fix it. But the judicial system is really where the buck stops. It ensures that every citizen can have a review of judicial, of um, legislative actions and it ensures that the Constitution will be enforced and improved. However, over the years, that branch in both federal and state levels has been weakened by political maneuvering that stacked the deck in order to produce decisions based on political leanings rather than law. We are very pleased and honored to have with us today two very distinguished speakers who can tell us a great deal about this issue. Frank Alcock, professor of political science at New College, and Judge Lee Hayworth, recently retired from the 12th Circuit Court. They've got a lot to tell you about today. And without further ado, our speakers will start. Each one will give a about 15 minute or 20 minute presentation. And then after that, we'll have questions and discussion with the audience. How can we fix what is going wrong? <laughs> okay. Thank you, Rosalie, and welcome to this event. I always welcome an opportunity to have what I hope is civil discourse about an important issue seems to be a rare quality nowadays and to see you folks coming here to to hear something um, that's really very important to me and to our, our branch uh, is is heartwarming the mission uh, assignment that was given to me by Rosalie uh, was in an email and the question or uh, the presentation was and I'm going to read this how legislators at all level are impacting the independence of the judiciary by changing the way appointments are made, creation of term limits, and increased pressure to follow political views instead of legal merit. Pressure also comes from the public and media. How can we protect the separation of powers and the right of all citizens to a fair trial? And then we're gonna discuss these issues and then have some questions. Now there's some limitations on what I can do and not do here today. Uh, it is true that I am a retired judge. The Florida Constitution requires all judges to retire at the age of, the young age, I might add, of 70, which is a wall that I hit a couple of years ago. However, I still serve as a senior judge. I'm on active service as a senior judge, which means I get called in from time to time to handle certain types of cases. And for that reason, I'm subject to the same judicial canons of ethics and rules that govern any judge. So there may be some things I will not be able to comment on. But what I wanted to do today, and I'm going to kind of start at a 20,000 foot level and then bring it down to something uh, uh, closer to the ground. I want to talk about uh, the independence of the ju judiciary. And we can't do that without discussing the principle of what we call the rule of law. And this is because the rule of law it's from the rule of law that we need an independent judiciary. Now, it's not a new concept. Uh, it goes back even to the Greeks. Aristotle said it is more proper that law should govern than any one of its citizens. And as conceived under a Republican form of government, the judiciary is the weakest of the three branches. 
Uh, Alexander Hamilton said in the Federalist number 78, and I'm going to paraphrase here, that the executive branch has the sword by which laws are enforced, the legislature has the purse strings, and the judiciary only has judgment, which means logic and reason. The rule of law means that the judge must subordinate his or her personal preferences and honor the oath of office, which is to support, protect, and defend the constitutions both of the state of Florida and the United States. The founding fathers were determined to create a system, a judicial system that was independent of political pressure. This was in keeping with their desire to keep a checks and balance system by splitting the government into three. It also fitted with their desire to see an America governed by the rule of law, which says basically every effort is being made to distinguish between judicial de decisions and political decisions. We don't have an independent judiciary because lawyers and judges are wiser than the rest of us, nor do we have one because decisions are reached without the input of people uh, because they're more legitimate or more just than decisions made by the people. We have an independent judiciary because the rule of written law embodies the collected wisdom of democracy, deliberations, federalism, and tradition. It's also relied upon in free markets. We keep our politicians accountable to the voters so, so that they can say, this is my decision, vote me out if you disagree. We keep judges independent so that they can say, this is not my decision, this is the way the law was written, and it is the same law that applies to everyone. Now let me give you an example of how the uh, rule of law applies in actual practice. How a judicial officer must subordinate strongly held personal beliefs. Susan Schaefer, a circuit judge in Pinellas, Pinellas County, passed away about two years ago. She was the chief public defender in, the, in uh, Pinellas County, the Sixth Circuit, when she was appointed judge. Now, she was an implacable foe of the death penalty. She fought against it passionately. So what happens? She gets assigned to the criminal bench. She finds herself with a docket full of the most egregious capital cases. Judge Schaefer wound up putting more defendants on death row than perhaps any other judge in the state. She became a statewide expert in the field, teaching judges, including myself, and most of the judges currently on your bench here in, in uh, Manatee County, how to make sure that when you impose the death, death penalty, you did it in a way that conformed with the law. Did she change her personal views? No. She had to follow the law as distasteful as it was for her. Now, the efforts by politicians to curtail the court's authority or to control the outcome of important cases arises from what is called judicial activism which is really a complaint leveled against judges who have made a decision that's at odds with the politician's personal or political position. To me, judicial activism is when a judge reaches a decision on something other than notions firmly grounded in legal principles and the controlling facts. In other words, when a, a judge lets their personal opinions and preferences control the result. Now, usually the controversy arises in cases involving constitutional issues. Now, I was a judge for 26 years. I cannot recall a single case where I ever ruled a law unconstitutional. And this is true not only of myself, but most of our colleagues on the, on the trial bench, which is the county and circuit court. It's because those decisions are almost always made by the appellate judges. And it's toward them that the accusation of uh, activism is usually leveled. Now, nationally, the accusation, accusation of judicial activism most often comes from the right, accusing judges perceived as being left-leaning. But the poster child today for activism is a conservative, Roy Moore, former Chief Justice of Alabama. He refused a federal court order to remove Ten Commandments from the courthouse grounds in Alabama, and he refused to accept the U.S. Supreme Court's legalization of gay marriage. He said it was against his religious principles. When it comes to legislatures, it's understandable that legislators will get upset when a court declares one of their acts unconstitutional. Now, a classic example is League of Women Voters of Florida versus Ken Detzner. Many of you may be familiar with this. It's a 2015 case where the Florida Supreme Court found that the trial court's 
a finding that a 2012 redistricting process and resulting map, map that apportioned Florida's 27 congressional di districts were tainted by unconstitutional intent to favor the Republican Party and incumbent lawmakers. It was a five to two decision with two justices, often called conservative, who dissented. It resulted in a redrawing of the, of the maps that uh, give rise to the precincts and, and the districts here. Very controversial. So do we really want to have the legislature deciding if their own redistricting maps are tainted and unconstitutional? Really, who else could do it but the judiciary? Let me give you two examples of recent legislation attempts. This was last legislative session. And by the way, uh, the next, I think the session starts tomorrow. Uh, and it's, it's, uh, it's gonna be interesting if any of these are revived. One of them was judicial term limits. There was a serious proposal uh, to amend the state constitution to limit to 12 consecutive years the number of years Supreme Court justices and district court judges may hold the same office and prohibiting justices or appellate judges from being reappointed for one year after they left office. Now, the motivation behind this was obviously to try to limit the number of judges because there was dissatisfaction among certain members of the legislature in regards to uh, decisions being made again on the appellate bench. I don't think they're so concerned about the trial courts because we haven't been very active for the most part in constitutional issues and reversing legislative opinions, but that's the, that's the province, generally speaking, of the appellate court. So that's where they're focused. It doesn't take a whole lot of, of uh, thought to see the problems with such a proposal. For example, if you, this were passed, you'd have lots more judges appointed who may conform to the appointer's political bias, thereby increasing the possibility or the opportunity to politicize the bench. What lawyer with outstanding judicial skills would be willing to give up a successful practice, sacrifice all their clients just to have to start over in 12 years? What quality of applicants would you draw in such a situation? And then last, wouldn't there be a temptation if you're a judge approaching, say, the 10th or 11th year to start shading your opinions in a way that would make them more attractive to future employers? In other words, engaging in kind of a self-job hunting. In any event, it didn't pass. It failed in, in May of 2016. Another decision. This was very interesting to me. If you know the history of the, uh, uh, of the judiciary, it was a bill that proposed that the legislature have the authority to overrule a decision by the Supreme Court or an appellate court. In other words, uh, by a resolution adopted by two-thirds vote of each house, uh, the legislature could declare a law or any other legislative act operational and continuing after being declared void by the Supreme Court, a lower state or county court. And the, way I, the reason I say that is surprising is because it came from what you would think would be a strongly conservative uh, part of the legislature, legislative override of judicial decision was debated by our founding fathers. In England at the time of the revolution, parliament could reverse any court decision. So judges were basically held beholden to the legislature. But Alexander Hamilton, again in Federalist number 78, decided that under the constitution, the federal courts would not just have the power, but the duty to examine the constitutionality of statutes. Thomas Jefferson was not such a fan. You know, the history between Jefferson and Hamilton was not a good one. By the way, I just finished the biography, which is a great book. Uh, if you got a chance, you got to read it. I was kind of a Jefferson guy, but now I'm a great believer in Hamilton. In any, any event, uh, Jefferson, said that uh, he thought that judicial review would make the Constitution nothing but, quote, a mere thing of wax in the hands of the judiciary, which they may twist and shape into any form they please, end quote, which is the position which was being advocated, I think, by Speaker of the House uh, Richard Corcoran when he was supporting this particular bill. But uh, Hamilton went on by that. Uh, Hamilton's view was vindicated in a case called Marbury versus Madison, which was 1803. Uh, John Marshall, Chief Justice, wrote the opinion, 
And uh, Hamilton made pretty clear that a constitution is in fact and must be regarded by the judges as a fundamental law. It therefore belongs to them to ascertain its meaning as well as the meaning of any particular act proceeding from the legislative body. So the concept of checks and balances, legislature passes a law, somebody's got to make sure that it's constitutional. And in England, the parliament could decide whether or not it should fly or not. But here we, we draw a very clear line, a, a, a golden line in the sand that says it should be done by the courts. And, um, but there are checks and balances on the judicial uh, process. For example, appellate decisions are not a, a one-person decision. It's a group decision. The appellate courts, we have five district courts of appeal in, in the state. They typically decide cases on a, on a panel of three judges in which two need to concur. Supreme Court has seven justices out of which five must concur. Uh, so it's not like one person making the call. If the reasoning is wrong, if a case is, has error in it, it's conspicuous. It's written and published so anybody can look at it and critique it. And it is done fairly regularly. And then, of course, we have the ballot box. Uh, appellate judges are subject to merit retention, and they are appointed uh, basically by the, the governor. There's nine judges on each, uh, I'm sorry, nine members on each judicial nominating commission. There are 26 judicial nominating commissions in Florida because we have 20 circuits, five appellate courts, and one Supreme Court. So that's 26 separate judicial nominating commissions. And then, of course, we have a judge that is unethical. The Judicial Qualifications Commission, which has a, member, a number of laypersons as well as uh, lawyers uh, and judges, can decide if that person should have uh, their right to be a judge suspended or revoked. In, in Alabama, with Judge Moore, they, they had something called the Court of the Judiciary that had to sit in session and actually remove Judge Moore twice as the Chief Justice because of what his obstinacy to the uh, federal court decisions. We also have impeachment. If a judge commits an offense or does something that uh, is un makes a legislature uneasy or doesn't think it's right, they can impeach him in the House and try him in the Senate. So um, that's kind of my overview of this. Uh, the, the whole idea of trying to inject politics into this, and I know people will be on, be upset with certain decisions that the courts make, but that goes with the territory. And, it, and it, the judges, and I would encourage you to read opinions. I mean, the opinion in um, uh, League of Women Voters of Florida versus Detzner, beautifully written. I mean, it explains why they thought they had to do the redistricting of these maps. Uh, so I encourage you, because a lot of them are very well written, and I think some of the be most beautiful prose sometimes inspired prose is written by the U.S. Supreme Court in their decisions. They go on and on, and you'll have people debating back and forth. But if you enjoy well-written uh, material, uh, I think you would appreciate reading those. So that's, that's basically um, what I wanted to tell you today, and I will be ab able to answer some of your questions. I'm particularly uh, pleased to be here with Professor Alcock. I was a political science major in, in college, so I hope I said nothing that needs to be corrected. But if so, listen to him. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Judge uh, Hayworth, and thank you for inviting me here. I think if there's any correcting uh, happening, it's going to be Judge Hayworth correcting uh, any faux pas uh, that I make. What I'd like to do in my time before we have some questions, I'd actually just like to go through a little bit of recent history with respect to the legislature's attempts to secure more control over uh, the Supreme Court and the judiciary uh, starting in 2010. Um, I actually think some of those attempts uh, to change some of the rules and the constitutions might be petering out in part because I think the Supreme Court might be getting a lot more conservative uh, at the end of this term. And I'm going to switch gears and I want to talk about uh, a, a, a looming potential, a potentially looming uh, constitutional crisis about who's going to get to nominate um, uh, uh, 
three Supreme Court justices in, in Florida because we do have uh, three judges uh, that are limiting out uh, because of, of age. Uh, and it's a very interesting case. And there was just a ruling uh, on a case that was filed uh, by the League of Women Voters. Uh, there was just a decision actually a few weeks ago. So just want to talk a little bit about that because that just in terms of the significance of uh, both the court in and of itself and its composition. And I think for me, the, the thing at the top of the uh, the chart with respect to politics and, and law in the state. So let me just take you back. Let's just go back to 2010. Uh, and in 2010 was a fairly active uh, year with respect to activity on the part of the legislature putting proposed amendments on uh, the ballot. It was also the year, if you recall, that uh, legal women voters, um, Common Cause and some others, uh, were promoting the fair district amendment changes to the, the Florida Constitution. During that year, uh, if you don't remember, our Florida Supreme Court took three proposed amendments uh, on the, the, the legislator. These were amendments to our Constitution that uh, passed the joint resolution vehicle. So both the uh, House as well as the Senate at the time approved these amendments for the ballot. Uh, and uh, our Supreme Court uh, threw three of them off the ballot. There was one that had to do with some taxation. There was another uh, amendment at that time that was uh, uh, a torpedo aimed at uh, the Obamacare, Affordable Health Care Act. It was mostly rhetorical, and uh, uh, but it was pretty sloppy with respect to uh, a lot of language in there that was very subjective. Uh, it was more of a political statement. Uh, and there was also uh, a little bit of a Trojan horse uh, amendment that was meant to uh, to preempt uh, the fair district amendments at, at that time. <clears throat> and so if all of them passed, it would be unclear whether the actual ones that ultimately did pass uh, uh, would hold. So our Supreme Court threw all three of them uh, off the ballot. And the House Speaker at the time, Dean Cannon, really got angry. Um, didn't like that uh, at all. Uh, and so he did a couple of things. A couple of things happened in the 2012 cycle. In the 2012 cycle, uh, we had the three liberal judges that were often behind. They were certainly on, uh, against Dean Cannon's position in the legislature. Uh, and that was uh, uh, Justice uh, uh, Fred Lewis, um, uh, Barbara Perriente, and uh, Peggy Quince. Uh, they were coming up for their six-year retention vote. These are the same three judges that uh, will have to retire at the end of uh, 2018. But they were coming up for a six-year retention vote in 2012. Uh, and for the first time in the history of, of Florida, uh, at the behest, I think, of a lot of the re you know, Republican leadership in Tallahassee, they actually actively lobbied against. So the Republican Party actually threw their weight uh, uh, behind a recommendation that uh, three Supreme Court justices not, you know, that, that voters vote no for these Supreme Court justices. Up until that time in our entire history, our legislature has stayed out and not taken any positions pro or con with respect to uh, retention votes for, for justices. So they made an effort to have them uh, uh, fail their retention votes. That did not succeed. They all w were voted back in, uh, and Dean Cannon actually put a, an amendment on the con uh, on the ballot to make some significant changes uh, to uh, through the Constitution uh, to the Supreme Court. And those changes, um, I think, the most notable one uh, was that it would increase the number of Supreme Court justices from seven uh, to ten. Uh, and that it would split civil and criminal. So it would have five justices doing uh, civil cases, five justices doing criminal cases. <clears throat> In addition, the Senate would confirm uh, all judges. Right now, uh, the, uh, once the governor appoints it from a, a selection from a nominations uh, a committee, there is no check on the part of our Florida Senate. Different states do it different ways. But So the Senate wanted veto power. They wanted to be able to confirm justices. Uh, they wanted to expand the court, split it up, uh, and then there was another part of that amendment that actually would give them access to uh, files. Uh, Justice Hayworth had just mentioned in, <clears throat> on the 
the uh, Qualifications Commission, just access to background on judges. And again, it was a little bit uh, of a power play uh, there. And if you think about that expansion, too, at the time, if you didn't like the fact that there was four three decisions um, uh, that were leaning liberal and against a conservative uh, legislature, why not we add three more conservatives on there and then split them up and dilute the vote, and that's where we can get what, what we want. So that went on to the, uh, the ballot, and that got uh, rejected uh, by Florida voters in, uh, in 2012. Off went Dean Cannon, and some of that simmered down a little bit. You do have, even fast forwarding now, uh, there's uh, our, our legislature were uh, toying with the idea of, of term limits that could come back. Uh, I don't th think it will, um, but that certainly could come back. And there are some uh, changes, some potential uh, proposals within the Constant, Constitutional Revision Commission uh, a process that would affect uh, the legislatures. I don't really think any of them um, are going to make it onto the ballot, but we'll, we'll, we'll have to see. One interestingly uh, put on there by Republicans um, is actually rather than limiting the terms, it would extend the age uh, from 70 years old to 75 years old. So right now, uh, the maximum amount of time, uh, because you have to retire, I think it's the halfway point if you hit 70 in your term, and so technically I think uh, these judges might be hitting 72 or 73, but that would move that out to 78. Why would Republicans suddenly um, want to keep the judges longer? Uh, well, they think they're about to appoint a bunch of conservative judges and they want them on there uh, for as, uh, as long as possible. And I'll take questions at the end, but I, I don't really, I'm not so sure we're going to see anything that radical or that dramatic get to our ballot with respect to constitutional changes. Okay, let me go back to 2014. Um, if you remember, there was an amendment, it was Amendment 3 at that time, that attempted to clarify who gets to make, who gets to appoint Supreme Court judges in the situation where a Supreme Court justice term, according to the Constitution, expires at the very, on the very day and at the very moment that a governor's term expires. Should it be the outgoing governor or should it be the incoming governor? Our constitution, our Florida constitution, is not clear on that, on that issue. It's popped up in our history um, only a couple of times. The most recent time that this happened uh, was uh, when uh, you had Lawton Childs leaving uh, the, the governor's mansion and being replaced by uh, Jeb Bush. Uh, a Democrat was leaving um, and a Republican was coming in. And you know how they resolved it? Get a load of this. They actually got together in a room, came out and made a joint recommend, a joint nomination so they just, they worked together, a Republican and a Democrat, and, and agreed upon, and that was Peggy Quince, um, that, that, that's how, uh, first African American uh, Supreme Court justice here in the state of Florida. Uh, that was j a joint nomination, and so it just, it wasn't as, it, it didn't come to the fore in terms of a, a constitutional crisis uh, back in 1992. The only other time that you, you get any sort of potential insight was all the way back to 1955, uh, and that was, I think, Charlie Johns was governor um, and was replaced uh, by Leroy Collins. Uh, both Democrats, they didn't like each other. Um, and Governor Johns made an appointment for a, uh, a county judge. And uh, uh, Collins basically said, no, I want somebody else. Uh, and that went up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court at that time, uh, and I think the language, if you look at it, is pretty vague, uh, but they said that Johns did not violate his constitutional authority. So in essence, they ruled with Johns, the outgoing governor. But yeah, that was, again, we're talking over 50 years ago, a half a century. Uh, that's the only guidance that you have. What we have right now is a situation where Peggy Quince, um, Fred Lewis, and Barbara Perriente all have to step down. They can step down what they want uh, earlier, um, but you know how... Uh, uh, Governor Scott will likely uh, nominate justices that probably are a little bit different in their philosophy than these three justices. So I suspect they might want to hold on to their seats up until the very last day of their constitutional authority, the very last moment, which, depending upon which legal opinion uh, you read, uh, 
it expires the same time that the governor's uh, term uh, expires. Uh, when this was put on the ballot, it was uh, put on so that the outgoing governor would have the authority, and Florida voters uh, rejected it. Uh, it did not. It, it did not pass. And so now it remains unclear. Uh, and if, in fact, we're probably going to have a pretty competitive governor's race in 2018, uh, if a Democrat uh, were elected, this is going to be pretty fascinating because uh, Governor Scott has already expressed his opinion that he has the authority and he will be, he will be making the appointments of these judges on his very last day uh, in office. Um, those judges that he appoints will be very, very different than the ones that an incoming Democratic governor would want. If a Republican wins, uh, depending upon who it is, um, it, you might actually see something analogous, something similar to what happened between Jeb Bush um, and Lawton Childs. Uh, but if I would even somebody like Adam Putnam, Putnam um, and Scott don't get along if you haven't heard. So I, this could come back uh, with a tussle with the, the two of them. But if it's a Democrat that wins, and I, I do think this is gonna be a toss up uh, election in 2018, then we're, we're set for uh, a, a potential crisis uh, here. Uh, the League of Women, Florida League of Women Voters uh, this year uh, asked the, the Supreme Court to issue an advisor, advisory opinion uh, in advance, uh, and the, uh, the governor's office uh, made their case both with respect to having the authority and they also said um, that uh, uh, the court did not have the jurisdiction to make this decision because this was all hypothetical, essentially. You're talking about something that hasn't happened yet. Uh, the governor could leave the office, these justices could step down, and so it's a situation that hasn't happened and, and, the, and the court should not be able to rule in advance on an advisory opinion, which I think on legal grounds is probably fairly sound. Um, uh, and so the, uh, the court just threw it out like uh, three weeks ago. Uh, it was a six to one uh, decision. So uh, if this happens, I'm, I'm open to hearing uh, uh, Judge Hayworth's opinion, but I would think that you might, if there's a challenge and it has to go back to the Supreme Court where you have an incoming governor and an outgoing governor disagreeing uh, over who should be nominating the judges, well, the three liberal judges are no longer on the Supreme Court. Um, so what do you have? You have four judges, I guess, until the other ones come in. Four judges, I two are very conservative. I think I know how they're gonna vote. Um, the other two, I'm not so sure. Uh, so you might have a 2-2 vote. So you have an unresolved issue, and then a 2-2 vote on the part of the Supreme Court to resolve it. I don't know where we go uh, at that point. And so I think putting this back on uh, everybody's radar is, is pretty important. Again, this may or may not uh, come to fruition and in fact, if there is another Republican governor that uh, is elected, I suspect um, it'll, it'll be resolved politically. Um, if it's a Democratic uh, nominee wins the governor's race, then it will not be resolved politically. Um, and I'm having a hard time. I'm, I'm curious as to how it would be resolved legally given a potential 2-2 vote on a, on a a uh, deadlock vote on the part of the Supreme Court. So any, uh, Supreme Court. So any any clarity um, uh, Justice Hayworth can, Judge Hayworth can provide would be um, most welcome. I, the one, politically though, I'm sorry, I, I, I play down the middle. But you can't, you know, the hypocrisy um, because all the folks that are arguing in favor of the governor's right uh, to uh, uh, to uh, to appoint um, after at the very end of his term are the same people that. Uh, didn't see there was any problem in delaying uh, or supporting a Supreme Court, simply delaying a decision in the last year of the president's administration with a bunch of arguments that we should, you know, we should be waiting to see what the, the will of the people is in any given election, and that should be reflected in, uh, in something so as important as the, as, as the Supreme Court. And so that was, again, something that was a, an open seat with one year left in a president's term uh, that was stalemated. Now we're talking about uh, a, a real constitutional you know, an uncertainty where the, the governor's term and the Supreme Court openings happen, the end and start uh, on, on the very same day. So I think for me that, that that's probably the most salient sort of 
politics, uh, judicial politics uh, issue. Again, there could be some other things that come forward from the, uh, the uh, Constitution Revision Commission, and perhaps the term limit thing could come back on. I just don't think uh, uh, that it will for no other reason that you have a bunch of conservative Republicans that uh, are, are thinking they're going to get a really conservative court, uh, and they'd like to keep it there as long as possible. That's all I have, and I'm willing to take some questions. Thank you. We'll entertain, we'll entertain questions from the audience. Please use the microphone on the floor. And uh, before you start, though, I've got one of my own. Uh, I was wondering what either of you think of the originalist interpretation of the Constitution versus the, uh, I guess, the more um, modern interpretation. <laughs> the concept of originalist interpretation, of course, uh, uh, former Justice Scalia was a great exponent of that. Uh, when I was in law school, that was disparaged as a, an approach. Um, but it's very common now, and, and it's a very popular point of view. That's in the federal system. We don't really have that in the state. Uh, originalism, you know, well, the Constitution was 1845 or something like that, and so we don't have any of those problems. Um, it, it's troubling in a way because our, our society has evolved so radically uh, with things that have not been conceived by the, uh, by the founders. Uh, you talk about electronic surveillance and all those things and the Fourth Amendment that has progressed. So uh, <clears throat> it is, the, it is uh, very common in uh, some of the opinions of the U.S. Supreme Court, uh, particularly in the criminal side, uh, where they go back and say, you know, um, People didn't have automatic weapons, but they had other things, and therefore we have to uh, treat the law a certain way. Uh, so I don't have a personal opinion about it because it is a federal situation. Uh, but I do know that it's a, it's a very active debate in the, in the judiciary as well as outside. I'm sure political scientists have a, have a view of it. Uh, so uh, beyond that, I, I really don't have any comment, uh, Professor. <coughs> Uh, yeah, I, 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 I would not consider myself um, uh, an originalist. Uh, in the, I, I think the distinction between state and, and federal constitution is, are important here. At the state level, the most recent, uh, our, 1968 was our most recent constitution. That's the one that we're operating now. And that, that, the convention, the chair of that commission, Chesterfield Smith, he was explicit with respect to looking around at, at a, a state of Florida in the late 60s and seeing a, a state that was changing. And so he designed a number of uh, vehicles, more so than any other state, for changing the Constitution. But it was an intentionally, our constitutions, it's an intentionally made to evolve over time because the state itself uh, w was changing. I think um, with our my views on our federal Constitution, I say, it could be characterized I mean, with respect to the mission, or the, the purpose and the values um, that underpin the Constitution uh, in, in this country. I think fealty, we can maintain fealty to that over time throughout the history of our, uh, our country. But how best to achieve that and balance a number of tensions in society, these things change over time. And so uh, I think uh, uh, interpretation and interpreting our Constitution um, uh, that can evolve uh, over time uh, for, for very good reasons. And I think for me, uh, I think the thing that simplifies it the most with respect to an originalist position and why I don't agree with it um, is if you go back to the founding fathers when they finished with the Constitution, they didn't all agree um, at that very time what it actually meant. They had some differences of opinion in terms of how they interpreted uh, what they had agreed upon. So I don't, you know, an, an originalist interpretation sometimes indicates to me that there is only one way to look at a, a Constitution. And I think at any given moment, there's more than one way. And, and again, the Supreme Court, uh, you know, the highest judicial body in the land probably is not in clear agreement. And, and that might be a healthy thing. Uh, we're not a bunch of uh, you know, droids where, you know, there's diversity of opinion as well as thought. And so uh, I'm not an originalist when it comes to uh, interpreting and ruling on the competition. But I'm not a lawyer either, so I'm a political scientist. Good morning. Thank you both for coming to speak with us. Um, I'm Mary Rue as a member of the League of Women Voters. And I just wanted to um, say that uh, Judge Hayworth and I had many years of working on child welfare and child advocacy, and he 
has made profound contributions to our, our circuit in that regard, and um, I would like to acknowledge that okay. now. And of course, um, Dr. Alcock goes uh, to teach at one of the top institutions in the country, of which I'm an, uh, a graduate. So. <laughs> <laughs> I have a question for, um, for Judge Hayworth, and it's a kind of logical conundrum, because if the judiciary serves the rule of law, then why are judges combatants in conservative and liberal politics? It, what is it that creates the gap that allows this risk to the independence of the judiciary? And I, I would love to know what judges say to each other as they discuss uh, this issue. So why are judges combatants in this larger political field in their appointments and, and their decisions and their rules vis-a-vis -vis the legislature. How do we get here? You know, it's a good question. Uh, it hasn't always been that way. <clears throat> the, um, the battle between the two polar opposites uh, has, I think, become more critical in the recent times here, but I think it's because they're human and um, they have passionate feelings, such things as capital punishment, um, um, you know, um, Roe versus Wade, uh, gay marriage, those issues are burning issues, many of which have a uh, religious basis, and some judges uh, have difficulty separating themselves from it. I think it's a noxious influence. Um, I think any judge that uh, should be, any person should be a judge, uh, has to be introspective and make sure that those sort of beliefs do not interfere with their ability to make the right decision. Um, there is a, um, we've had judges who are very conflicted over all those issues and they have to enforce the law. It doesn't really affect trial judges so much as it does perhaps on the appellate bench. But if you have people coming from uh, a perspective uh, and their history and their, their culture has been one thing and they, um, and they're presented with an issue that they really have to be, we are taught to be self, um, you know, to look for inherent biases that we might have. As a matter of fact, I've had so many inherent bias classes at the Judicial College, I could give the class myself. You have to be able to identify yourself what it is that causes you to be diverted from the, the issues, legal issues and the facts. And it's a very personal thing, I mean, if you were raised, let's say your parents were Holocaust survivors, and you have a, in front of you in a criminal case a white power, uh, you know, a, a neo-Nazi, you know, you've really got to be aware that you have this this bias. Uh, if you're a um, Iraq veteran and you have a Muslim appearing before you in some matter, civil or criminal, you have to be aware that you have a certain feeling about that, and and you have to be able to regulate it. And because we're human and, and we make those mistakes, um, it, it does lead to polarization. And I think it's, it's a terrible uh, uh, evolution in our, in our law. But we still have cases where you will see somebody who's presumed to be, quote, a liberal judge making a decision that doesn't track with liber liberal principles. Same thing with conservatives. And it's not as widespread as you might think. There are some notorious cases where that happens. But for the most part, I think the issues that come before the court, particularly in our state courts, are not of that character. Um, now, you have some judges who feel certain ways about tort reform and medical malpractice. Uh, one of the problems we get is sometimes the law that's being interpreted is not very clear. Uh, legislature sometimes makes some really strange language and therefore, people, judges can look at that and make a decision, have disagreements honestly about what it means, in which case their particular philosophies may come into play. But for the most part, I think it gets more attention than it, than it, it, it justifies because um, you don't really see that division. The cases that our far Supreme Court's been accused of being politicized on are issues that went into the political era. For example, when they declare a law unconstitutional because, it, 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 for example, it penalized juveniles and sent them to uh, uh, death penalty for 16 and 17 year olds, some people think, well, that's, that's a political decision that uh, they decided they didn't want, for some reason, they like kids, they don't want to do it. But 
if you look at the, the opinions that are written, it has a very logic reason uh, argument behind it. So I don't think it's as widespread as you might think. The answer to your question, Mary, and by the way, thank you for everything you've done is with kids. You've, you've helped an enormous number of children in Manatee and Sarasota for that matter. Um, I think the, the, the real issue is that we need to have better judges. And one thing we can do is to have judges who are uh, neutral in those, in those areas and call them into account when they're not. Uh, vote them out if they don't do the right thing. Uh, but to me, it's, it's, not a good, it's not a good evolution in, in the law. And I, I do know lots of judges that work very hard to maintain that neutrality. I think most of them do. <coughs> There's something I, um, I don't quite understand, and I'm thinking of Citizens United, for instance. And I was told that it started with a law back in the 1800s, or some kind of judgment back in the 1800s. It said corporations are people. And since that time, there's been precedent. Well, can't some judge say, hey, this precedent is all wrong, and, <laughs> and make a different decision? You want to handle that one? Uh, yes, and they have. Uh, okay. <laughs> judges change, you know, uh, the, the court changes its composition, and when it changes its competition, uh, composition, um, you know, this decisions change over time. We've had a lot of that. Sometimes judges, which are, which are rare, but sometimes individual judges might change their opinion uh, over time on, on an issue or just see it in a, in a different way. Um, and Citizens United reflects I think an interpretation that balances freedom of speech and interprets uh, speech differently than past uh, past courts. It goes beyond. Um, I think we're, we're we're a number of past courts have, have ruled in in, uh, <clears throat> in different cases. Uh, that is right now. It, it's a, it was five four decisions. Um, the Citizens United decisions. There was a decision two years earlier. Uh, uh, I think it was Davis versus the FEC that I think is just as impactful um, on, uh, you know, with, with respect to a number of things that affect money and finance. But one of the, I think it was Alito in that one that uh, had said that uh, the government has no role in leveling the playing field within, uh, uh, you know, so providing funding or public finance or again, govern, you know, if the intent of a particular uh, policy measure is to try to give people equal amounts of money and level the playing field, that government has no business doing that. There is vociferous, um, dissenting opinions, but right now you have, uh, you know, on issues of speech versus a number of, a number of other values that are compromised, you have, uh, the court is where it is. Um, and it's unlikely to change, I think, until the composition of the court changes. Let me say too that um, organizations like this are so vital to getting the word out on um, issues such as uh, Citizens United. Um, Particularly, and I'm sensitive to this as a judge because we have to run every six years and people don't know about judges. And your organization, I know you used to, I don't know if you still interview them and say whether they're qualified or not, but they used to do that. And I've had to run twice as a judge and people don't know about you. And the, the, the vulnerability is for judicial officers, somebody with, who's well financed that has basically lots of money can buy a judgeship because they can go on the air, they can send direct mail, they can do things, and this may be perfectly unqualified, but unless organizations like yours are there to tell the public this person should not be a judge, they'll get elected. And, and I'm sure it has happened in some areas. Uh, and so to me, uh, the noxious influences of, of unlimited funds in not just judge races, but other things, is a real challenge to our democracy. And that's all I want to say about it. But it, it, it's concerning, particularly in the judicial arena, arena when the judges, uh, justices had to run for the Supreme Court, the three that he talked about, they had to go out there and have people try to raise money for them to counteract what was going on with the opponents. And uh, they weren't skilled in fundraising. They had to rely on lawyers and other organizations to support them. And fortunately, that went the right way. But I can foresee a, a situation where somebody could come in and, and with uh, you know half a million dollars and, and basically saturate the, 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 the public in a way that uh, would not be informative, would not show the true 
ability to be a judge and get elected, and you're going to have to live with the consequences, and it's scary. Okay. I want to thank both of you for being here today and for your candor in answering our questions and making um, the, the program. I um, am here with Indivisible, and we have a program coming up on January 17th because I'm really keenly concerned about um, the for-profit charter school and private school movement and the um, threat that poses for public schools. And it's my, uh, as a part of finding out about this, um, I, if I'm right, I learned that two of our Manatee School Board members were appointed by Governor Scott, and one of them, who's only lived in the county for two months, uh, is now the chair of the board. And I just, having been in schools my whole life, I never heard of this. Is this something that's always gone on and I just missed it, or has there been a change? Are, are you asking about the private school, public school thing? No, I'm sorry, about the governor appointing school board members. Well, I think it's been fairly common for years that the governor has powers to replace. Uh, they, uh, they get to replace sheriffs, they get the county commissioners and all that. So yeah, it's, a, it's not, of course they have to run usually the next general election, right? I mean, so it's not like for, they don't have it forever. Uh, they have to run to the voters and have them approve or disapprove of them and the appointment. And there's been several instances where the, the governor's recommendations have been rejected by the people and at the plebiscite when the elections held. Since that could be um, after some important decisions were made, how would one go about addressing that? I mean, it just seems like a school board, that leadership um, uh, position is, is really key. And even if they came in and, you know, we're going to be elected out at some point, in the meantime, a lot of damaging things could be done. So is there any way that that could be addressed or... Well, you've got how many people on your school board? Five? How many you got? So it's just one out of five. I mean, um, it, it, well, two out of five. Okay. So I don't know the answer, but. Uh, yeah, I think the way that I would interpret that is there's a, a gaming the system political tactic here that's really hard to do anything about it. Uh, there's a certain threshold um, that I think stops at the legislature. Um, if there's a legislature, if somebody retires in the middle of their term, uh, like we're seeing um, in the north part of Sarasota, you'll have a special election to fill that seat. Once you get down to school board races, they're not going to, uh, I think, undertake uh, the expenditure of a countywide ele special election. And so what happens is uh, there will be an election to refill the school board seat at the next regularly scheduled election, which sometimes could be um, you know, a year, year and a half. And so uh, what could happen is when you have uh, a governor uh, or somebody that has the power of making appointments that's philosophically aligned, then rather than extend your, you know, stay on the job for the entire term, you might retire a little early and that way uh, Politically, the governor can appoint who they want and they'll get a head start. They'll get some name recognition. They'll get onto the school board and maybe they'll make some impactful decisions and they don't have to be held accountable for another year or two. Um, and then it goes before uh, the voters. So it's a little bit of a gaming. Um, it's unfortunate, but I'm not sure I can think of anything uh, that one can do other than hold them allow, allow, uh, hold uh, your school board members accountable the first opportunity that you, that you have. Oh, uh, oh, I didn't see you. Yeah. Okay. I, 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 I just have a, a simple question about the jurisdiction of the state courts and the federal courts. Um, when you go through state courts, and uh, is, is, if you are at the Supreme State Court, is the only federal court you can go to the Supreme Court? Or how, how do you determine whether you should be at the state level or the uh, federal level? Well, as a state judge, go to federal court as much as you can. <laughs> uh, but uh, we got enough business. But to answer your question, the, um, there's sometimes overlapping dual jurisdiction in certain types of cases. But generally speaking, the, the, the state courts enforce the Florida Constitution and, and the state laws, legislature. Federal courts 
they handle the federal uh, uh, acts and they also do this, the U.S. Constitution. But state judges are oftentimes having to decide something that overlaps into the U.S. Constitution, mm -hmm. like on Fourth Amendment issues and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. But generally speaking, it depends on what the, what the issue is and how the case arises. We have diversity jurisdiction with uh, rep representatives or citizens in different states. We have purely uh, 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 federal issues that can only be decided in federal courts, something called federal preemption, where only the federal courts can do it. Uh, so it depends on the nature of the claim. Okay. That's basically the answer. And uh, if, you, if you get to the state Supreme Court, is the only court you can go to from there the U.S. Supreme Court? No. Or can you a, go to no, other? As, as a matter of fact, on death penalty cases, they run the gamut all the way up to the Florida Supreme Court. And oh. Multiple decisions, perhaps on one case by the Florida Supreme Court. And then at the end of the case, they can start over in the federal district court and move up through the appellate process all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. Oh, Again, okay. I think that's a fair statement. So all right, thank you. Yes. The claim in the, in the, the law, what, whoever is seeking re relief is going to be pointing at something that's state or something that's federal. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I'd like to ask a question. Uh, my sister is a judge, and uh, occasionally she gets all kinds of threats and I was wondering how you all deal with it. We live in such polarized times and people are so emotional. And I've read stories where judges, have, their lives have been threatened, uh, their families have been threatened. And I was wondering how judges deal with that. Does it in, inhibit their decision making in any way? No, it doesn't. The, uh, you know, the most dangerous, we have five divisions in our circuit court. Uh, we have family, we have probate, guardianship, we have felonies, we have juvenile uh, slash dependency, and then we have family. Um, the most dangerous division is family. People get very concerned about children, spouses, domestic violence. Uh, that's where the most danger is for judges. Uh, not in criminal. We like to say that in, uh, you know, the judges say that in, in crime, uh, felony cases, you see bad people at the worst. In family court, you see, uh, uh, you know, in, 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 yeah, you see bad people at your best in crime, you see the good people at the worst in family, and in probate, you don't see anybody on account of them being dead. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we do have security systems set up in place. Um, I, I can't go into all of them, but obviously our courthouses, we like to keep protected. We just had an opinion out of the Second District Court of Appeals where our chief judge made a very strong case about keeping not just courthouses, but the places that you might go in the clerk's office weapons free. Uh, we, we had a big debate about that and the, the District Court of Appeals came out very strongly in support of the chief judge's position, how important it is to keep them safe. But there's no, there's no secret. Uh, let me tell you, when I was, I was chief judge from 2007, 2000, uh, to, uh, to, uh, 2011, uh, and in Arcadia, I went over to Arcadia. Y'all been to the courthouse in Arcadia? It's built in 1910, beautiful courthouse. Marble floors, very small. There was no security. I mean, you could walk into that with an AK-47 <laughs> And, and, you know, everybody in, I'm not saying everybody, I don't want to pay too broad, but a lot of people in DeSoto County, you know, have a gun in the rack, in the truck, and they're carrying, they got concealed carries. And so I had to go to the county commission with our court administrator, and we said, you know, we really need to get some security here. Um, you, know, you know, we need to have metal detectors and all that, and they said, well, you don't have the money. We just can't afford it. The sheriff was saying, yeah, I'd like to do it, but I, I just don't have the money. Well, they said, come back in two weeks. We'll talk to you about it then. In between that meeting and when we came back to the county commission, in Clearwater, a guy walked in with a gun and started shooting. And uh, he was, I think he was killed in the courtroom, in the courthouse. We came back and they said, you know what? <laughs> Maybe we should do something. And so now we have security in the, in the Soto County Courthouse. But there are courthouses still in the state of Florida do not have any security, which is, to me is a problem.
Thank you. I think we've learned an awful lot today. We thank you so much for sharing your information and views. And it's up to you now to let your legislators and congressmen know that you want an end to their stacking the deck. What we want is judges with experience whose only goal is to render a just decision based upon law. Next month, we're going to have a good one next month. You've heard about the election, the special election the school board is having on uh, March the 20th. We're going to have a pro and con debate at our next hot topic. That'll be February the 12th. So far we've got Charlie Kennedy coming and Linda Schock, and there may be additions to the teams. So we'll learn more about that and you'll have a, a better idea of how you want to vote on that afterwards. I want to thank METV very much for taping our program and replaying it on their station and also on their website. For the TV schedule or to watch our program online, which should be posted in a few more days, go to www.metvweb.com. We also encourage you to join our league. The more members we have, the more we can do. And, um, after we're finished here, Wendy's going to come up and talk to you about solar, if you can wait a few more minutes. Thank you.